Cynthia finally had all she had dreamed of, yet she remained inexplicably sad. Cynthia had dreamed of being a beauty queen since she was 12, and she had worked hard at achieving this goal, but now that she was this close to getting the crown, she felt empty. Cynthia's name had been published in the newspaper alongside her picture as one of the final contestants for the crown, but it felt like she was living a borrowed life. She couldn't see herself whenever she looked at the newspaper picture. She felt like she had died and was buried beneath all the makeup layers and trapped somewhere in her skinny body. Yet, she knew that if she let herself be and showed herself to the world, she would become what she feared the most. She loved all the attention and acceptance she was getting, but some of her knew it wasn't really about her. Cynthia couldn't afford to go back to being a social pariah. She knew about that life and didn't want any part of it again. Moving to a new town had allowed her the privilege of reinventing herself and becoming this new person that was the star girl of the entire school, the girl who got wasted at parties and hung out with the cool kids. Cynthia, before the remake, was an introspective and quiet girl who loved to read, made straight A's, and didn't party as much. That Cynthia was authentic and comfortable in her skin, but that Cynthia had been unacceptable. That Cynthia hadn't been considered cool, so she had her buried. Cynthia was the dream of many girls, the trophy girlfriend every senior year student wanted. Even college students wanted to be with her. She was attractive in that way. Cynthia had moved from the upstate area alongside her mother, who was a single mother, because she had been bullied repeatedly. When her mother insisted they move, Cynthia felt guilty for upending her mother's life. Although her mother always said she didn't mind, Cynthia knew she missed the life she used to have. Her mother had a great job. She had friends and was active in the community, volunteering at different charities. On the other hand, Cynthia found it hard to make social connections. This was because she stood out. Cynthia began seeing the first signs of vitiligo when she was about 10. And when her father left and never returned when she turned 12, Cynthia blamed herself. Cynthia let herself believe he left because she was imperfect and wasn't good enough for him. Over the years, it became more and more evident as she lost the color of her skin. Although her condition wasn't contagious, Cynthia was often treated like an outcast to be avoided by her peers. She was avoided like the plague. Cynthia was hurt by this treatment of her by her peers and became some kind of hermit, keeping to herself and burying herself in the worlds of the characters in the books she read, reimagining her life as theirs. Cynthia felt ugly and overweight, even though she was neither of those things. Cynthia couldn't make any friends. The closest thing that she had to a friend was Lotta, her dog, who always made her feel loved and worthy. Aside from Lotta, the only other person she had been able to forge a relationship was Miss Helen, the school librarian who she always chatted with and who always made it a point of duty to reserve good titles for her as soon as they came in. Miss Helen never stared at her too much or avoided her eyes like other people tended to. She didn't feel like she stood out badly around her. Besides from that, every other person avoided her. She had become comfortable with being avoided, which shocked her when she got to high school and started getting bullied. It was as though her bullies suddenly realized that she existed and started to make a living hell for her. Cynthia had to endure physical and verbal abuse from her schoolmates every day. It was a lot to deal with. They'd often make insensitive remarks about her skin and her body. Hey, you need a crayon? I'd tap that fat ass, but it's no color. What, was the angel asleep when he painted you? Your mama had sex with the alien, now you turned up with no color. I feel sorry for all the ground that has to carry all that weight. It was so much that Cynthia longed for the times she was invisible. She started to skip class and started hiding away at the library. That gave her so much time to herself that all the negativity started forming in her mind. Cynthia became depressed and anorexic and started to lose a lot of weight. Cynthia wasn't even what one would regard as fat, but she wasn't skinny either. Cynthia was slipping into depression, but no one was around to help her. While Cynthia's mother loved her very much, she was also working very hard, which meant she barely had time outside work to spend with her daughter. She had no idea anything was going on in Cynthia's life until she tried to take it. After about a month of skipping classes, Cynthia stopped going to school altogether as she went further down the black hole of depression. When Cynthia tried to take her own life, 
She had spent the first few hours of the day writing a heartfelt letter to her mother thanking her for accepting her, even though she wasn't good enough. After Cynthia's suicide attempt, her mother, who was weighed down by the guilt of not paying enough attention to her daughter, decided a fresh start would be suitable for both of them. So they moved, and Cynthia reinvented herself. Cynthia's mother was greatly bothered by the changes her daughter made to herself to fit in. She watched with pain as her daughter she knew and loved profoundly transformed herself just because she didn't feel accepted. Cynthia's mother knew the bubbly, happy girl act that Cynthia was putting on was all a facade, so she tried to get her to go to counseling, but this always led them to fighting. It was after Cynthia's reinvention that she met Jason. Jason was the star of the basketball team. He was, he was handsome, popular, athletic, and most notably for Cynthia, he read. Although Cynthia had her party girl thing going on, she still read many books. However, the difference between her and Jason was that she hid her obsession for literature while Jason flaunted it and even made being a bookworm such a cool thing. Jason's Instagram page was filled with pictures of books he had read and his thoughts about them. For every post of Jason looking strikingly handsome doing his thing at school, hanging out with friends or practicing for a game, there were ten more about books. Jason and Cynthia became friends after a school trip where Jason was battling a severe case of strep throat and, as such, couldn't participate in the group activities. Cynthia had gone out of her way to sit and chat with him whenever it seemed like he felt left out. Before the trip, they had only seen each other at parties and hangouts with classmates, but had never interacted much. The school trip was where they forged their connection. Cynthia adored Jason, and he her. But Jason didn't know her. Or did he? Cynthia looked at the lineup of finalists. They all looked the same. They were all in a room preparing for the contest's final round. This was the standard. How could she even think of going outside the norm? Cynthia had flashes of all the times she was bullied because of her skin as she went on painting visible parts of her body to have an even tone. When she was done, she texted Jason, asking if he was at the venue already. They would get drinks after the event, whether or not she emerged the queen. Cynthia seriously contemplated telling him about her skin condition, but at the last minute decided against it. She was enjoying what they had going on, and there was no need to ruin it. She had the chance to be whoever she wanted, but a part of her just couldn't settle into this new persona she had created for herself. I believe we must start paying serious attention to climate issues and protecting the Earth for future generations. Thank you, Cynthia said as she stepped off the podium. The room was unusually silent. She had just given an entire speech about climate action without even a single applause. Cynthia looked around the room, and that's when she saw all the pictures of her from her former life. While speaking, there were supposed to be slides of photos of every contestant. Cynthia was sure those were not the pictures that she had submitted. Cynthia summoned all the courage she could muster to walk off the stage with her head held high. She knew she wouldn't be crowned queen now that everyone knew what she looked like. And worse, her classmates now knew Jason. Cynthia crumbled to the floor backstage and began to cry. Then she felt a hand on her shoulder. Jason, I'm sorry, I can explain. You don't have to explain anything. I am sorry. I am the one who owes you an explanation. I shared those photos with the committee. What? Cynthia, you're beautiful just the way you are. And you're allowed to appear to the world however you want to. I hated to see you hiding away all the time. But you should have asked me. I know, and I'm sorry. You're not mad at me. No, I'm relieved. Well, thank you. They embraced each other and stayed that way for the remainder of the contest. I just want all the girls and women across the world to be able to show up as themselves, not to have to hide their imperfections, not to be humiliated for something which they had no control over. That's my dream for the future. I might not have won the crown, but I gained something valuable from that experience. Cynthia said into the microphone as she concluded her interview. 
Cynthia had just finished her last radio interview for the day. She waited in front of the station for Jason to pick her up so they could have lunch together and then go back to his place to work on their college applications. Her relationship with Jason had grown stronger over the last couple of months as she began to reveal herself more. And even though Cynthia had lost the crown, she gained something more. She gained the courage to show up as her true self. Cynthia's mother was so proud of her. She felt relief that her daughter was learning to live as herself, just like she always wanted, and that she had started to go into counseling. Cynthia was beginning to see herself as she indeed was. Beautiful. She started working on her grades even harder and had shed the whole party girl lifestyle. That wasn't her. She was working hard at keeping her grades up so she could go to either of the two Ivy League colleges she had her eyes on. Cynthia knew it wouldn't be a walk in the park but was also confident that she could do it. And more so, she could inspire others to do it as well. Jess was born in Ohio. Her family was wealthy enough. Jess's father owned a pizzeria, and her mother was a schoolteacher. Jess grew up and enjoyed living with a loving family. But in an instant, everything collapsed when she was two years old. The parents decided to go to the supermarket before the new year and congratulate Jess's birthday. They left the little one with a friend of mom. On the way to the store, her parents were caught in a monstrous shootout of local gangsters. They were passing by. By chance, both were killed, and Jess was left alone in the world. Her parents died. The girl had no relatives. Her family friends did not want to take the baby into their families, and Jess was placed in an orphanage through social services. The girl had a rough time there. In her infancy, she was too active and developed. The teachers didn't like it. The little kids were jealous of her. Why she did everything well, and they didn't like it. Often the students annoyed Jess. They could tie her to her crib, hide her sandals, or paint her face. When she was a teenager, she and the guys from the orphanage worked part-time at a gas station, washing cars for a bit of money. This did not please the local group of children in the area. When Jess and her friends finished the next working day, they returned to the orphanage on the way through the alley. Local gangsters were waiting for them. The guys were with baseball bats. They began to fight, which often happens between teenagers. Jess always carried a small box cutter. Jess accidentally stabbed her attacker in the eye while defending herself and her friends. She was terrified of this. A police officer was passing by. Seeing the fight, he quickly called for reinforcements and an ambulance. It turned out that Jess had wounded the son of a local gangster boss. No one could figure out who was interested in what would happen to the girl. Jess went to jail, the kids' prison. She was afraid of this place. The children in prison were angry and hurt by life, even more than those in the orphanage. Jess cried a lot at night, wondering why she had to bear such a heavy burden. For her excellent behavior, the girl was moved to a double cell. The cell neighbor was Jeanette, a girl from France. She was older than Jess. Jeanette was locked up by accident. She was at the crime scene. A murder was committed in the woods, and the killer left a knife on the corpse. Jeanette saw the man's body lying down. She was scared to give her first aid, threw away the knife, and tried to help, but it was too late. The girl called the police but the police thought it was Jeanette who killed the man based on the fingerprints on the knife and put her in prison. Jess and Jeanette communicated well. Jeanette had more time in prison than Jess. Jeanette once told her that in a good life before prison, she was dating a guy who was French and called him Nicola. They loved each other, but when something happened that put Jeanette behind bars, he didn't believe the girl was innocent and left her in the courtroom. Jeanette missed him, She truly believed she could be with her lover when she got out. When Jess found out she was going to be released, she was 19. Jeanette asked her to find Nicola and give him a letter. Jess kindly agreed as she had no idea what to do when she got out. The first thing after the prison, girl began to look for Jeanette's boyfriend. At the address where the girl lived were other people. But Jess wasn't the person who would drop a case halfway. She started canvassing the neighborhood, looking for Nicholas. Her search was a success. 
one of the neighbors told her that the boy had returned to his homeland in France, and she could contact him via social media. Jess could find him. She texted him about wanting to meet and tell him what was necessary. Nicola gave the green light. They met in Ohio at a pizza place owned by Jess's father. Of course, the girl didn't know that this place was once her family's. Nicola, seeing Jess, was amazed at the beauty of the girl. She was exceptionally slim, had a figure with graceful contours and smooth curves, thick and dark hair, light waves that emphasized Jess's tall neck. Her lips were wonderfully plump, with smooth contours. Her eyes, her eyes were sky blue, with a green ebbing look deep inside Nicholas. He thought he had met the girl of his dreams, and he didn't care where she was from or what she meant to say. He fell in love with her at first sight. Jess gave the letter away from Jeanette, but Nicola didn't even want to open it. He didn't want to dredge up the past, much less the forgotten one. He was utterly drowned in Jess's eyes. She asked him if he could help her with the housing for a while. Nicholas offered her an option to stay with him, but only in France. He promised her help with work and documents. A girl who had nothing to lose and who had nothing to do but a terrible past didn't give up and went to France with a stranger. Nicola did not deceive Jess. He helped her with everything. Over time, he began to look after Jess beautifully. He gave her exquisite souvenirs and flowers and invited her to the cafe. Jess fell in love with a guy. They started dating, and Jess even forgot that Nicola was Jeanette's boyfriend, her friend from the past. Jess and Nicola got married. Jess's life took on bright colors that were unfamiliar to her. She had a job, a family, and a love she never felt for herself. So they lived a few years in love and harmony. They traveled a lot and enjoyed each other. They understood each other without words, and it was priceless. One day, Jess found out she was pregnant. She told her lover, and he was pleased. Young people waited for the miracle for nine months. A healthy boy named Jack was born. Jack was a copy of his father. Her parents loved their son very much. Jess gave him all her warmth and affection, which she missed so much as a child. There was no sign of trouble as the doorbell rang one day. Jess opened the door and saw Jeanette. Jeanette understood what was going on immediately. She could not forgive her friend for starting to live with her lover. She wanted to destroy their whole world, but she didn't say a word to Jess. She left the place silently. Jeanette set their house on fire at night when everyone was sleeping. Jess and Nicola escaped but lost their treasure their son, Jack. Time stopped for them. They couldn't believe it had happened to their family, to anyone but them. Jess felt unhappy again and remembered how she was a child in an orphanage. Furthermore, there was no human being near her. Only Nicholas was there, and her child was not there. It was a terrible shock for any mother. Jess stopped smiling. Her life turned into a dark hell. She hated Jeanette, she wanted to find and kill her. Nicholas felt less sorry for her. He paid less attention to her and went into himself. Jess found out where Jeanette was living and went to visit her, but she couldn't kill her either, and she wanted to look her in the eye. When she saw Jeanette, Jess was stunned. Jeanette was bald, terribly thin and pale. She was sick and had an incurable disease. It was cancer. Jess realized that life had already punished this woman without her involvement. She thought in her head that, in this life, everything comes back as a boomerang whether you like it or not. Of course, the pain of losing a child will never be alleviated, but it began to blunt and hide deep in each of their hearts. After a while, strange things started to happen in Nicholas and Jess's lives. Jess began having nightmares at night. She became afraid to go to bed and to go to sleep alone. The first thing Jess dreamed was that, in the dark, a girl walked alone into a room she didn't know, a wall covered with pictures of her children, and every child in a photo invited her to his room. Jess was horrified by this. This dream was repeated many times. 
It tormented her and prevented her from sleeping. She began noticing that she was seeing the children from her dreams on the city streets in real life, which frightened her even more. She saw all this in reality as hallucinations. She shared this with Nicholas, but he just laughed at her and didn't understand her pain. Nicholas suffered in his way, so all his love for Jess may have died forever. Jess went to a psychologist, and she was starting to think she was going crazy. The therapy session didn't help her. The girl was confused about what to do and who could help her. She accidentally met a woman in the street, a spooky-looking older woman. The woman was old and ugly, with her hair torn and a basket in her hand. She walked up to Jess, looked into her eyes, and waited silently. Jess was frightened, but stood there and did not run away from the older woman. So they stood for a few minutes. Suddenly the older woman told her that she had been cursed, and if she kept it that way, Jess would soon be gone. She asked the old lady what she could do, and she said she could help her if she believed in her. Jess agreed. The next day, Jess went to the address given to her by the older woman. She took a long drive to the place far away from the city. She didn't say anything to her husband. There she found a house with a sinister-looking older woman and went to her. The woman was waiting for her. She began to perform a ritual unknown to Jess, after which Jess fell asleep for two days. Jess woke up happily asleep with a happy heart and saw the older woman lying on the bed, and she didn't seem so disgusting to Jess. The older woman called Jess to her place and said, You need to leave France for your homeland. You will be pleased and have a daughter there. Jess could not believe her ears. She thanked the older woman and went home, reflecting on what had happened to her. At home, she discovered Nicola was leaving her for another woman. Jess wasn't even upset. She was preparing for a new phase in her life. She packed all her things, bought a plane ticket, and flew to Ohio. There she bought herself a small house. She started renovating her garden, which helped her not to think about her hard life and the death of her child. She had no more nightmares and was sleeping soundly. She had peace of mind. She got a job. She decided to go into floristry, and she began collecting combinations of flower bouquets. It calmed her. One day a man came to her for flowers. He was familiar with her face. She recognized in him her friend from the orphanage. They got to talking. It turned out Marcus was from the same orphanage. He worked as a surgeon in Ohio. Marcus lived alone and never had a family. He recently found out where his mother was buried, who had placed him in an orphanage. And he came to buy her flowers to take to her grave. He asked Jess to accompany him to the cemetery. Jess felt his soul, so she did not refuse. He waited until her shift was over, and they went to his mother's grave. Marcus silently put the flowers on her grave without saying a word. On the way back, they went to the cafe. The weather was cold and snowy outside. They talked for a long time and reminisced about all the sad and funny parts of life at the orphanage. They remembered how they ended up together in the alley and how, after the terrible fight, Jess went to prison. Marcus said that after the war, the guy Jess stabbed in the eye went to the orphanage to look for Jess, and he wanted to apologize for putting Jess in prison. His vision was barely injured. There was only a tiny scar under his eyebrow. Jess couldn't believe her ears that a man had realized his mistake. Marcus and Jess started dating and moved in together pretty quickly. It was New Year's. They spent the New Year's together and decided it was a new episode in their lives, and they didn't want to break up, and they were going to live together. It was a Christmas miracle for both of them, and for Jess, it was also a birthday gift. They spent that winter together. Jess told Marcus how she lost her baby and how unhappy she was all along. Marcus worked as a doctor all his life after the orphanage, helping people and living with no one, always being alone. A few months later, Jess and Marcus learned they would become parents. This was unexpected news for both of them and very happy for them. Jess remembered the older woman's words that she would have a daughter. 
At the ultrasound, Jess learned the sex of her baby, and it was a girl. Jess smiled and realized that everyone could be happy in life. Just everyone gets their happiness at different times. Her name was Julie. She studied at an excellent prestigious university. Julie and her friends often went to Cannes, Monaco, and Mallorca in Spain summer. They spent time at parties where Naomi Campbell, Irina Sheik, and other prominent personalities rested. The girls in her circle and she could afford the hotels where they party from morning to evening. They spent money without thinking about anything. They had many opportunities. They were all from wealthy families. Their parents did not spare cash for their beloved children. After such a fun vacation, they had to learn a lot. Famous and wealthy parents must have educated children. Frequent social events and news from magazines had to correspond to the statuses of their circle. At one of the college parties that the college kids were putting together, Julie met him, the different one. He didn't go to this university. He was called by someone who knew the faculty. Julie didn't expect anyone to impress her at first sight. And how could he be here? His unusual and closed nature caught her attention. Many guys tried to get to know her, but they were like everyone else in her circle. But that guy was very different from the other guys. There were no branded items on him. His bang covered his face slightly. He wasn't much of a talker. But there was something about him that immediately caught Julie's attention. He stood quietly aside and did not draw attention to himself. But not for Julie. For her, he became a center of interest. John, he said quietly, and reached out to Julie. Julie, she smiled back. The friends did not give much importance to their acquaintance, but a month later, they were already walking hand in hand and could not take their eyes off each other. Their union was not in the spirit of all, but love was so burning that the young pair was regardless of others' opinions. They spent time together, as shown in the most romantic films. These were happy moments of their teenage life. They saw their future together. Together, they dreamed a lot and had fun. Lovers enjoyed each other every day. John was from an ordinary family. His college, where he studied, had an urban planning direction. His parents worked at the factory and didn't really care about their son. He and Julie met on evenings after school. When they separated, they missed each other so much that they looked forward to an early meeting. Their love was visible from a distance. When they met, they spent time alone together. They were not bored at all together. They'd go out, talk about things, and always find something to do. Over time, their feelings began to diminish, and their different social statuses became more apparent in everyday life. As it happens, time passes and people's relationships stand still. John knew he had to act. He can't give Julie what she's so used to, that luxurious life. John dropped out of school and started working. He had less time to meet Julie. Julie didn't know what it was about because she was in a relationship. John believed that the financial component could hurt his self-esteem and he would lose his lover. John couldn't afford to live on someone else's dime. Without a good job, he couldn't live on the same level as Julie. He got an excellent job as an assistant architect. He worked a lot and stayed at work in the evenings. He had a clear goal, to achieve a good position, and he aspired to the same life as seen by his friends and Julie. She was irritated that John had less time to walk and spend with her. She tried to explain that she didn't need any of this. She was willing to live with her lover in any circumstances. John understood that it was all talk and nothing more. They couldn't have lived together for a long time in such different statuses. Living with Julie and not giving her what she was used to would sooner or later ruin their relationship. It was just a matter of time. After another year, which Julie finished perfectly, she got a call from her father. Julie, congratulations on your successful graduation. I've arranged for you to go to further training in Paris. But Dad, I don't want to go to Paris. My friends and John are here. I can finish my studies here, Julie said sadly. This is not up for discussion. Either Paris or no entertainment and trips. You will live on your own with your John. Julie was still on the allowance her father threatened, or so she thought. Julie didn't want to upset her dad. She tried to finish her studies perfectly. Her father did so much for her. 
Her dad gave her a good education and fun and carefree childhood. In the evening, she called John to her room to talk. John did not understand why he had to go to Paris, so far and for a whole year. He didn't even have time to tell Julie about his promotion. His efforts were in vain, he thought. Julie had already decided, although it was difficult for her to tell John. She promised to come over for the holidays and said the year would pass unnoticed. But deep down, she knew she wasn't, and they would be put to the test. She believed then that life was easy, and everything would be the same in a year. A month passed, the second after her departure to Paris. Calls between them became less frequent. Everyone had their own life. She studied, and he worked. She lived for herself and her father. He lived and worked for her. Every time they talked, John would invite her over and ask her to come over at least for the weekend. But Julie never showed up, citing a bunch of cases, girlfriend's birthdays, and other excuses. She asked John to wait a little bit longer. Soon, very soon, we will meet again, she said on the phone. John understood that a year away was a test of their relationship. He trusted Julie, but it was a waste. At one of the parties, Julie had a few drinks and couldn't resist a burning brunette who was also clearly interested in her. She soon forgot about John. She felt no remorse. She thought the distance had already extinguished the feelings between them. But John did not think so. He tried and worked for Julie. A year passed. Julie came home. She couldn't hide her affair from John. She'd have a hard time living with it. She knew it. She didn't think she was cheating either. Julie's news crushed John. All his efforts were not in vain. His goal was more important than the girls, meeting with friends. He loved Julie very much and tried to please her. He became the head architect and was able to open his firm. This was a good lesson for John. It wasn't long ago. Julie was on a plane with her father. She had a seizure and cramps. She only remembered waking up in a room with her head bandaged. The attack was based on a developing tumor that caught essential parts of the brain. The plane was urgently grounded, and Julie was hospitalized in the hospital. She did not remember any of this. She was taken to the operating table unconscious. There was an operation for many hours without bringing her to her senses. Everyone was there except John. It's been a long time since John's met the girl who fell in love with him. Perhaps she did not love him if he were that student from the past who had nothing. Now he has become a prosperous architect. He had his own design office. Soon, he and his girlfriend had a great wedding and a beautiful girl. John and his family moved into a big country house that he bought for his family. Meanwhile, Julie was having a hard time. All the parties went to zero. Friends visit her, but she didn't need to. Her life was filled with treatment, hospital beds, and medication. She fought for her life every day. Because of her illness, her hair fell out. She had to get a wig. She became shy about her appearance. She lost a lot of weight. She could not help but look into the mirror. Now, she could only dream of dating boys. It was hard for her to tell anyone about her illness and fate, especially John, how she lacked his support. But she couldn't even call. After all, she did such a bad thing to him then. She had a bad relationship with her father because Julie decided to freeze her egg. She made this decision herself and lay on the operating table. Her father was outraged and displeased with her father's rash actions. Julie was being treated with powerful drugs that killed her chances of staying pregnant. The egg was stored in a particular medical bank, the storage of which had to be paid every year. She hoped for a happy future. She wanted to marry and have a child someday. Sometimes she was called and asked to sell an egg to a same-sex family. Of course, she would not accept such offers. Julie hoped and dreamed of a child. She followed John's life through social media. Her life stopped at those student years before the accident, while John's life was evolving daily. His life was like the one they dreamed of together. They wanted a girl to call Mary. Everything remained in Julie's memories. As the years passed, Julie was left alone. Her friends also split up and started families. The occasional meeting with a friend was as uninteresting to Julie as possible. Julie never got over John. One day, John learned about Julie's situation from people he knew. He was told of a complex illness and an argument with her father, who had stopped helping her. Her dad got married for the third time, and Julie was all grown up, and she had to take care of herself. 
her father had less contact with her because he had a new family. Julie bought a small apartment with Dad's money to live independently and earn her own money. It was the last gift from him. She did not have enough money to furnish the living room. Young people were interested in her, but the relationship did not last long. Julie, who was at university, had a lot of issues. She couldn't find anything in the boys that had ever hooked her in John. His humility, dedication, care, confidence, and dissimilarity were her captives of her. Such qualities were not present in any of them. No one could give her the feelings she felt with John, and she no longer felt like a young, beautiful, and promising girl. But one day, she got a doorbell. It was a furniture store messenger. She brought everything that could be arranged in the apartment. Tables, chairs, bed, headset. Everything was quality and expensive. Julie couldn't afford such furniture. She didn't know who it was from, but she could only guess. It's a gift from John, she thought. There was no note, not a single call from John. He did well despite Julie's actions in the past. Julie began to teach English to children and teenagers. It turned out that the study the father hoped for was unsuitable for his daughter's interests, and it was hard to get settled with such a specialty. Her salary was enough for food and household supplies. She could no longer afford the luxurious life she used to have. There was no time for such a life either. She had to pay the bills and gas and support herself. She had enough problems. There was no help from whom to expect. Every day, Julie would return to her apartment in the evenings, where no one was expecting her. Soon, Julie met one man and married him. They never had children. He loved her, and that was enough for her. It was a modest and quiet life without John. It was as if they had switched places with John. That wasn't, though. Julie had lost everything she had. Oh, if I had stayed then, she thought. But to return the time was impossible, and to regret what had been done was also wrong. She could not forget John. His life was happy and prosperous, unlike Julie's everyday life. If John hadn't met her, things might not have worked out so well for him. Was John happy? She could only guess. The stimulus and the goal always amazed the works and the excellent result. Two fates and so different. Someone rises and someone has to fall. But the main thing is not to crash, but to get up and continue your way. In life, there are ups and downs. They only make you stronger and give you a chance to start over. Sometimes, decisions can turn your life around in ways you didn't expect. So, before you make a decision, evaluate the situation and think twice. You can offend someone close to you. You can break yourself or another's life. You don't have to jump to conclusions. Don't do what others want. Do what you want. Listen to yourself first. No one will live life for you. You make the rules for yourself. Her life was sad since childhood. She was born into a large family, fifth child. Her father was a heavy drinker. Her mother was always busy with her affairs or other children. She was very lonely. She felt no one needed her. The grief happened when Mary was six years old. Her father died. The times began terribly. They didn't have enough money all the time, but they had good people who brought food and clothes. Her mother fell into depression when Mary's father died. Mom's tantrums happened quite often, as well as nervous breakdowns. Her mother took her anger out on the children. She yelled at them constantly, sometimes even beat them. Her mother didn't love Mary and got hurt a lot, but she was the smallest and couldn't defend herself. She was punished for every wrongdoing. Mary was troubled with her mother for the bruises and for calling her names, insulting and humiliating her. Mary would sometimes close herself to her mother in the toilet and scratch the wall with a pen about her unbearable life. Mary's childhood was just like that. Mary moved to the seventh grade and met a girl named Bella as her class was new. Bella was a pariah. No one was friends with her, and all her classmates shunned her. But Mary decided to go against everyone. The class hated both girls. The break at school was a nightmare. Mary and Bella were throwing dirty rags at coated clothes with chalk. Bullying of girls became permanent at school, and Mary switched to homeschooling. She graduated with difficulty. Mary got her first job at 17. She was washing dishes in the dining room. She became a kitchen worker six months later, and then she got a job as a cook. 
Mary had been working for two years in the cafeteria, where the men who liked her often went. She met Adam there. Mary fell in love quickly, and they moved in together. Adam often went away on business trips, and Mary was very painfully separated. Adam went away on another business trip, and Mary couldn't get through to Adam all day, and the next morning, a woman answered her phone and told her that Adam was asleep. Mary hung up on her, at which point the whole world collapsed. Her tears rolled down her cheeks. She didn't understand why Adam did this to her, because she loved him so much. They were married together. After a while, Mary forgot about Adam. She often walked along the waterfront alone and thought of life. Adam was waiting for her in a dark alley with a knife one night. He grabbed Mary from behind, hit the building hard, pulled out a knife, and stabbed her in the ribs. Mary was shaking with fear and horror. She could not yet understand that Adam was standing behind her. He turned her around after two minutes, and she was stunned. Adam was high. His eyes were angry, full of rage. He grabbed Mary's hand, but did not remove the knife. He dragged her down to the road. His car was there and ordered me to go with him. Adam brought her to the apartment. Then they spent the night together, and by the morning, Adam had fallen asleep, and Mary had managed to escape. Mary avoided Adam and did not return his calls. She met another man in the dining room at the time, Jack. Jack came from out of town for work. They started seeing each other a lot. Jack would walk Mary home every night, and one night, Adam was waiting for them outside the house. The men began to fight, and Mary ran home. Jack won the fight, and Adam left Mary alone. Jack asked Mary to marry them after six months, and she agreed. Their wedding was modest, with only relatives. Mary got pregnant three months later. Her pregnancy was difficult. She often lay in the hospital. Her child was born on time, but frail. He was often ill and developmentally challenging. The child became very sick when he was one and a half years old. The doctors didn't think much of his illness. They said it was just a cough, prescribed him pills, and sent them home. The baby began to feel very bad. Mary called an ambulance four days later. The baby had a high fever. Unfortunately, the child died in the hospital three days later. It was pneumonia, which his weak body could not cope with. Mary had not spoken to anyone for three weeks. She prayed every day and cried, and Mary did not understand why her life punished her. Then Mary decided to divorce her husband two months later. She had no feelings for him. He came home one day not sober, and Mary decided to talk to him about the divorce. He beat her very badly that evening. Jack was kicking and punching her. Mary was drowning in tears, begging Jack to stop hitting her. His punch was powerful. Jack kneed Mary on the head. Mary passed out. Jack became sober the following day. He realized what he had done. Mary filed a police report on Jack at the time. Jack was called to the police, and after talking to the police, he returned home. Jack kneeling and begging Mary to withdraw the statement from the police. Mary was very angry with Jack but agreed to start the application if they divorced quickly. Jack agreed. The property was sold, and the money was divided equally. Mary was trying to forget what had happened to her over the past few years. She called her friend Gwen, who had been friends for a long time, and Mary called her to meet her. Gwen was popular with men, so she had many friends. She brought Mary to her friends. There were many handsome, charming men, but Mary only noticed one. Michael turned out to be. He was tall, slim, and hilarious. He grew up in a good family. His father was a prosecutor. Michael went to police school, but never graduated from police school. He tried to work as a lawyer, but failed. He did not work permanently. They quickly hit it off. Michael went to work for a month. They called each other every day and got much closer. They started dating a month later. Michael was very romantic, sometimes gentle. He asked Mary to live together. She moved into his house. Everything changed at one point when his father died. Michael suddenly became very angry and cruel. His father gave him money and protected him from crime before, and everything changed at one point. Mary and Michael ran out of cash. Michael was left in debt, and Mary was threatened. Mary worked as a small store salesman then and had barely enough money to buy groceries and pay utility bills. 
Michael owed a lot of money, so they had to move to another town because they threatened his whole family. They moved to the big city, rented an apartment, and started a new life. Mary was trying to find a job, and Michael was pretending to look for a job. He wasn't going to work. Money started running out. Michael's mom sent them more money, but she said it was the last time. Soon, that money was running out. The rent had to be paid. Mary sold her computer out of despair. The money came from the sale, and it was enough for a month. Mary was sitting by the window and didn't know what to do. There was no money left, no job, no rent. A fight arose amidst these problems between Michael and Mary, and Mary ran into the bedroom and closed the door, and Michael was furious, and he broke down the bathroom door. He realized what he had done, told her to pack her things, and said they were leaving the next day. Michael called his friend, and he came to pick them up. Michael's friend took them to Michael's grandmother's. Mary got a job after one month, and she got a job at a small bakery. She worked every day because there was no money. Michael lay on the couch all day, and when his grandmother kicked him out of the house, he didn't come back sober and angry. Michael said a week later that he had found a job. The job was at the construction site. He left every day in the morning and returned in the evening. He promised that the money would be paid, but later, Michael didn't bring the money, even after two weeks. Mary had saved up money for that time to get a room. Michael took the money gladly and started looking for a place to live. They didn't move in. They kept living with Grandma. Mary started talking to Michael about renting. He seemed nervous, and she realized he was lying. He stole his grandmother's money, and it turns out he was drinking and living for a while. And then he started gambling and needed more money. Mary gave him the money to rent a place, and he lost it. Mary was desperate. She got involved with an alcoholic, gambler, and thief in the same person. Michael was proud and was not ashamed to tell everyone that his dad was a prosecutor. Everything was revealed, and then there was a terrible scandal. Michael grabbed Mary by the hair and began to beat her in front of his grandmother. Mary had endured everything. She had nowhere to go. Mary was almost broke, and home was a long way away. Grandma left after one month and left their things on the landing. They spent three days on their belongings at the entrance. Michael called his mother, who sent a car to pick them up. They came home. Mary got a job back at the store, and Michael took his time with work. He had spent his father's money before and didn't want to do anything. Michael started drinking a lot of alcohol from idleness. Life was unbearable for Mary. He caused her scandals at work and insulted and humiliated her. Mary called the police often. Michael avoided responsibility because he had many friends among the police. Mary tried to break up with Michael. He stalked her, threatened her, and beat her on the street. She was afraid to leave work sometimes to go home. Michael's mom told her she was sick of it. She blamed Mary for choosing Michael. Michael stopped drinking a month later, started acting normal, and they started dating again. Michael got a good job as a driver four months later. The business trip dragged on, he didn't pick up his phone all day, and the next morning, a girl answered his phone and said that Michael didn't want to talk to Mary. The world collapsed for the second time. Mary didn't believe it was happening to her. The story repeated itself as with Adam. Mary was in utter despair. She didn't want to see anyone. She didn't talk to anyone. Mary shut down and became depressed. She couldn't survive the betrayal again because she forgave Michael so much, tolerated his abuse, and he did that to her. Mary saw only one way out. Mary met a lovely man named Tom on Tinder. He lived in a different city and invited Mary to come and meet him. Mary decided a month later. She took some things and visited Tom. The acquaintance was excellent. They spent a wonderful three weeks together, but had to return home. Tom only let Mary go on the condition that she return in one month and move in with him forever. Mary settled all her problems in one month, packed her things, and moved in with Tom. She wanted to leave all her memories of resentment at home and never think about them. After all, she was finally going to have a good life. Mary had moved in with Tom. A year had passed since then. Mary felt beautiful. No one had ever hurt her in that house. The nerves returned to normal. Mary became much calmer. The man was with Mary, who cared for her, not bullied her. Tom was a hard-working and responsible man. 
He never humiliated or betrayed Mary, so she loved and valued him so much. They often went for a walk in the woods. Mary remembered walking alone, and now her walks were always with Tom. He supported her always, even in the most foolish endeavors. Mary turned thirty today and became happy. She managed to forgive all those who hurt her. She was able to forget almost all the terrible things she did. She became much kinder to everyone and learned to trust people again. Life began with a new line, Now all the bad things are behind us. Vanessa's childhood was happy and serene. She was a long-awaited and much-loved child. Her parents spoiled her and tried to spend all their free time with her. This family could rightfully be called ideal because love and harmony reigned in their home. However, happiness was interrupted by a series of terrible events. On that day, the parents of the young princess were going to the anniversary of a colleague and a longtime friend. The celebration was planned to be celebrated in the country house, which was two hours away from the city. Vanessa's parents were supposed to stay overnight in the country house, but suddenly Vanessa's mom felt bad. She had a headache. They began to say goodbye to the subjects of the occasion and get ready for the road. It was pitch dark on the highway, and besides, the weather had cleared up on the street. A thunderstorm was brewing, and the rain poured down like a bucket. The thunder and lightning probably knocked out the power, and the lighting on the road was gone. They had to drive almost blindly. Almost at the entrance to the city, the car skidded and it flew into a ditch. Later, the examination would establish that Vanessa's mother died immediately, and her father remained alive for several more hours. If cars were passing by and someone had called an ambulance, he could have lived. Vanessa stayed with an elderly grandfather. She hadn't been told about her parents' death for a long time. When they reported that they were no longer on this earth, she withdrew into herself and did not speak to anyone for almost two years. Only the incredible efforts of her grandfather and boundless love for her only granddaughter were able to bring her back to life. Nicholas's life has been bright and eventful since childhood. His father was a first-class pilot, and due to the change of duty station, they often moved with the whole family. Nicholas liked these moves, although his mother was outraged every time and demanded that they settle somewhere for a long time. One day, her dream came true. At that time, his father was serving in Boston and he remained there to serve, and Nicholas dreamed of New York. He had never been there before, but he really wanted to visit this amazing bright city. When he graduated from university, he decided to try his luck and left for the city of his dreams. His parents tried to dissuade him, but to no avail, and he did not regret his decision. At first, he worked in a construction company and then organized his own company. The construction business turned out to be very successful and in demand. In a short time, Nicholas was able to build himself a house in one of the prestigious cities of New York in Brooklyn. Nicholas really wanted to take his parents to him, but his mother was categorically against it. She was tired of moving, and she was categorically against going to the city again. Nicholas's parents were pleased with their son's achievements. The only thing that upset them was that Nicholas did not have a family and children, even though he was already 40 years old. His parents' dream came true in the most unexpected way. Before the new year, Nicholas came to visit with a girl and introduced her as his bride. Vanessa was a very nice and pleasant girl, but one thing confused her family. She was 18 years younger than Nicholas. His father tried to talk to him and explain that this was too big an age difference, but Nicholas was stubborn. Dad, I met the girl of my dreams. It's not my fault that my dream was born when I was already 18. We love each other, and that's the main thing. What if she's with you for the money? You see how greedy young people are now. I see, of course, but Vanessa is completely different. I'm sure of her. Well. See that you don't have to regret it later. She will pull money out of you, and she will get a young admirer herself, and she will support you with your own money. Dad, come on, I'm not 80 years old. I'm coping quite well myself. Let's close this topic. We came to visit, not to quarrel. Okay, as you know, my job is to warn. Nicholas remembered this conversation only now. 
a year and a half after his wedding with Vanessa. The day before, the driver informed Nicholas that Vanessa was probably playing tricks on the side since she constantly goes to the same place. Nicholas couldn't believe it. He loved his wife very much, and he felt that she loved him too. Why would she do that? What might she be missing? Nicholas asked himself these questions. We have intimacy every day. I even get a little tired, but I understand that she has such an age that she wants to all the time. That this is not enough, I do not understand. Nicholas's thoughts were interrupted by the very culprit of these thoughts. Vanessa entered her husband's office and sat down next to him on the arm of the chair. Nicholas, let's go out tonight. Come on, where do you want to go? I don't know. I want to go to the movies. I haven't been to the movie in a long time. Do you mind? She said. I don't mind. Then I'll see where everything is shown and I'll get tickets. Vanessa kissed her husband on the cheek and flew out of the office. Nicholas watched his wife go. Well, it can't be that she has someone on the side or I don't understand her at all, he thought. In the evening, they went to the cinema, then sat in a restaurant. When they returned home, Vanessa began to kiss Nicholas. After a while, he decided to ask, Darling, tell me, do I suit you as a man? Vanessa jumped in surprise. What kind of stupid question is that? Of course you suit me, 100%. Do you doubt it? No, I just wanted to ask. We have an age difference, so maybe you're missing something. Nicholas, what is this nonsense? Yes, you are better than any young man. Stop talking nonsense. I don't need anyone but you. Nicholas really wanted to believe his wife, but there was a worm of doubt inside that gnawed a hole. Vanessa, can I ask you something? Ask me anything. If you suddenly fall in love with someone else, or just stop loving me, don't lie to me. Just come and tell the truth, okay? Vanessa was genuinely surprised by such a request. Nicholas, you, you scare me with such requests. Did I give you reason to think so? No, just promise me you'll do it. Okay, I, I promise. Even though I don't understand anything. The next day, Nicholas had another conversation with the driver. Tell me, are you sure that she goes to her lover? Maybe it's a salon of some kind, or a meeting with a friend. I don't know, the driver answered. Usually we go to the supermarket. She picks up groceries, and we go to the same address. She won't let me go up to the apartment with her, and she drags all the packages herself. It seemed strange to me, so I told you. Nicholas found this behavior strange. He didn't understand why she didn't take a driver with her if she was seeing just a friend. She probably doesn't want the driver to see who his wife is visiting. Therefore, she had something to hide. Nicholas was upset again. Yesterday, he was sure that everything was fine with him, and now he began to doubt again. He asked the driver, How often does she go to this address? The driver replied, Twice a week, maybe three. Tomorrow she will go again. She's already warned me. Okay, I'll figure something out. Can I take a video? You'll show her later and ask her where she goes. No, it definitely doesn't fit. Uh, I'll think about what to do. Nicholas thought all day and figured out what to do. He will make up and introduce himself as the new driver instead of Christopher. This is the only way he can check where his Vanessa goes. The next day, when Vanessa left the house, the car with the driver was already in the yard. She, as usual, got into the back seat and told the driver, Please, let's go to De Plain. As usual. Take me to the market on the way. Good morning. Your driver is sick, so I'm his replacement, Nicholas said. Where exactly in De Plain? Vanessa, without even turning to the driver's voice and continuing to look out the window, corrected, uh, Sorry, at uh, 2257 Pinewood Drive. We'll stop at the supermarket before that, on the way. All right, the driver obediently said and drove off. Then everything happened, as Christopher said. Vanessa went to the market and she was gone for 40 minutes. Then she loaded three huge bags of groceries into the trunk. When Nicholas put the bags in the trunk, he glanced at them briefly. Basically, there were dairy products, meat, sausage, cereals, vegetables, and a lot of sweets of different varieties. They drove up to the right house. Vanessa got out of the car. You don't need to come with me. I'll manage on my own. Wait for me in the car. I'm sorry, but I have to walk you out. The chief's order. And I said no. You don't need to. If Nicholas asks, tell him you escorted me. But that's not true. I don't want to be out of work if the boss finds out that I didn't see you off. She was getting angry. 
If you keep your mouth shut, he won't know anything, Vanessa said in a confident voice and got out of the car. She took the bags from the trunk and entered the entrance. A couple of minutes later, Nicholas got out of the car and also went to the entrance. He heard the door of the apartment on the fourth floor close. Nicholas thought that he would have to visit the owner of this apartment. Vanessa came out of the entrance about 50 minutes later. She was as calm and unperturbed as before visiting this house. The driver took the hostess home and drove to the same address, getting rid of makeup on the way. When he got to the right floor, Nicholas wondered which apartment to call. He was really scared now that his wife was a traitor, but he could not help but find out the truth. He reached out and pressed the bell of one of the apartments. No one opened the door. He went to another apartment and called. After a few seconds, I heard footsteps, then a grinding noise. The door opened. A man of at least 70 years old was standing on the threshold. Hello, I'm from an insurance company conducting a survey. Can you spare me a few minutes? Nicholas was making it up on the fly. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, of course. Walk around. Nicholas went into the apartment. The man pointed to the living room and invited him to go there. Upon entering there, he immediately noticed several framed photographs of his wife. So, everything is correct. But it was just hard to believe that his wife was having an affair with this grandfather. What did you want to ask? We are hosting a deal for single elderly people. We offer to issue a policy at a favorable price. Tell me, do you have relatives? Do you live alone? I only have a granddaughter, Vanessa. She doesn't live with me. She's married and lives with her husband. She is a very good girl. I raised her myself and helped her get on her feet. When my son and daughter-in-law died, she was only six years old. I couldn't send her to an orphanage. I decided I could handle it myself, and the two of us lived together. She recently got married for love, but to a rich man. And do you know what they are? Which ones? Nicholas became interested. Well, what important intelligent? I immediately told my granddaughter, don't tell your husband about me. I don't want to be an obstacle to your happiness. She does not forget me, comes often, helps with food. I know she loves me, and that's good, he continued. Nicholas was surprised. So Vanessa thought he would be against her grandfather, or would he be embarrassed by her background? He already knew that she came from a poor family, and he didn't care. The main thing was that they love each other. He even felt offended that his wife had such an opinion about him. Have you ever seen her husband? Are you not interested in who your only granddaughter lives with? I didn't see him, but Vanessa said he was a very nice person. She loves him, and he loves her, and that's the main thing. When there is love, young man, everything else is nonsense. Believe my experience. What is your name? My name is Richard, the elderly man said. Nice to meet you. My name is Nicholas, and I am your granddaughter's husband. Just don't be angry with me. I accidentally found out about your existence. Vanessa didn't say anything. The driver who brings her to you told me. Richard narrowed his eyes and looked at the man with interest. He smiled and said, I guess he thought my Vanessa was going to the side, right? Well, she's not like that. She's honest and decent. I had no doubt. It was just interesting to understand where she goes so often. I wish you and Vanessa hadn't told me she had a grandfather. Although I am a wealthy person, I am not a greedy oligarch who considers other people to be trash. It is very good. Nice to meet you. Richard, I have a business proposition for you. Nicholas told his grandfather what he had come up with. Richard initially refused, but eventually accepted Nicholas's offer. Vanessa was cooking dinner when her husband called and said that today would be earlier than usual. Great. I'm so glad when you come earlier. We can talk more. I won't be alone today. We have guests, so set the festive table. This is a very dear and welcome guest. And who is he? Vanessa was surprised. Usually they warned about guests in advance, and they did not like unexpected visits. Honey, I'm driving. I'm not comfortable talking. I'll be there soon. You'll find out. I'll introduce you. Vanessa was an impatient girl, and she really disliked all sorts of intrigues and practical jokes. But there was nothing to do. We had to wait. She quickly set the table, cut a couple more salads, and ran upstairs to change. When Vanessa came downstairs in a beautiful dress, Nicholas was just entering the house. She ran up to her husband and hugged him. And where are the guests? she asked impatiently. The guests are already here. 
but I do not know how to properly introduce him to you. Nicholas was deliberately stalling. He knew that Vanessa was burning with impatience. It was his little revenge for what he had been through over the past few weeks. This man has done the impossible, and I respect him very much for that. Vanessa listened as if mesmerized, and she was very interested to find out who it was. Nicholas, can you introduce us already? What are you pulling? What did this man do that was so important? She was angry. Nicholas took Vanessa by the hand and led her into the yard to the car. What did this man do, Vanessa asked again, and walked over to the car. This man gave me the person most dear to me, you. Vanessa was stunned and looked at her husband. Then she pulled the door handle and saw her grandfather. She looked first at her husband, then at her grandfather, and did not understand anything. Nicholas, explain what's going on. How do you know my grandfather? Grandpa, how did you end up here? Richard got out of the car slowly. Vanessa, don't worry. We'll tell you everything now. Richard, take Vanessa and go into the house, and I'll take your things, Nicholas said. Vanessa didn't understand anything at all. They went into the house. As they sat at the table, Nicholas honestly told the whole story, starting with the driver's suspicions. During the story, Vanessa alternated between being angry, surprised, and laughing. In the end, she was glad she didn't have to hide anymore. Nicholas offered his grandfather to live with them, and he accepted the invitation. In the evening, when Grandpa went to sleep in another room and the couple were left alone, Nicholas asked, Vanessa, I just can't understand one thing. Why didn't you tell me that you have a grandfather? I don't know. At first, Grandpa asked me not to talk about you, and I agreed. Then somehow I couldn't tell him, and it would look strange, so I had to go to him secretly. I could not leave him in any way because he is my own family. I have no one else but him and you. Forgive me, Nicholas. I understand that it was stupid. Thank you so much for bringing Grandpa to us. Don't apologize. It's okay. Don't do it again. Otherwise, this understatement leads to such consequences. I had a bunch of gray hair added while I was figuring out what you were doing. I promise, Vanessa said, gently snuggling up to her husband.